Well, we're almost two months away towards the end of 2023. And needless to say that every single time when we see people, our friends, especially during the holidays, that we tend to ask each other, how's it going? And how have you been, by the way? And so far, given the fact we're looking at this geopolitical change, so many topics that particularly related to topics on politics, on the economy, and also on social changes can really get us more emotional, or should we use the word even frustrated? Now, here's another question when you think about when you are frustrated, what will be the best way for you to unleash the pressure verbally? And have you thought about swearing? And now I want to be honest, there are many times that at the dinner table, I wanted to, but I consider myself to be an educated person. And maybe I need to really withhold myself from using the profanities. But today, according to our special speaker, the swearing can be fun and also swearing should be acknowledged not only in this social standard, but also in this more philosophical way. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, and who is Dr. Rebecca Roach. Again, Dr. Roach, it's a senior lecturer in philosophy at Royal Holloway in University of London. And she teaches practical ethics, logic, philosophy, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of psychiatry, philosophy of language, and early modern philosophy. And again, if you're familiar with his work, and recently she came out with his new book, it's called Why Swearing is Shocking, Rude, and Fun. Well, Dr. Roach, and welcome to The Missing Piece. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, again, Dr. Roach, I have to uh, be honest, as I mentioned in the intro, it's really difficult and not to swear on a daily basis, especially when we are feeling the frustration, the anger, and sometimes even just the disappointment. But I want to get started with a question again, you mentioned in the book, when we look at swearing today, why are some of the regulations and also some of the rules on swearing and so confusing and so inconsistent and also how necessary it is for us today to understand and appreciate those regulations. What do you say to that? Mm. Yeah, the, when you look at the regulations around swearing around the world, it's it's pretty confusing. Um, there are sort of contradictory rules. Uh, people are sometimes punished quite severely for swearing in some cases. Um, and it's quite difficult to sort of try and uncover what principles are guiding these sorts of uh, regulations. So, so that was something that I wanted that I wanted to dig into. And I think you know what, what you said right at the beginning there uh, is key. I think you know you you talked about how swearing has this role in expressing emotion. You know, so when we're in pain or frustrated, angry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, we might want to swear to let off steam um and, and that role of swearing in sort of helping us express and um regulate emotions is is key i think um now as for the the regulations i think what we've got here is um there's this sort of tangle of attitudes around swearing so there's first of all that that sort of um emotionally expressive aspect um, and when you think about sort of how how we behave in public settings, often, you know, even if you don't swear in general, it's um, often inappropriate to express strong emotions, especially negative emotions. So there's a, a bit of a taboo around just being visibly furious in public. <laughs> people can be a little bit threatened by that. So I think sometimes when when people are swearing, not that it's always to do with emotions, but often it can sort of underline that um, emotional expressiveness. So it can almost sort of signal or some sometimes we take it to signal that somebody's a bit out of control. And I think also it's it's really linked to disrespect, mm. which you also kind of put a finger on there. You know, when you said that you 
you might sometimes want to express yourself with swearing especially if you're feeling emotional mm. but you might keep a lid on it because it's usually not appropriate to, if mm. you're in, if you're in a, a polite context and so i think you know again it's not always the case that we're expressing disrespect when we swear but very often that can happen mm. and especially when we think about cases of inappropriate swearing you know sort of swearing that's likely to shock people around us um it's often Often taken as a sign of disrespect mm. and I think just this tangle of things together makes us react in quite a sort of knee-jerk way to it so often when you're talking about swearing you'll, you'll encounter some people that just say oh well there's never an excuse for swearing ever mm. without necessarily being able to explain why or you know if there is an explanation that that comes later and I think that sort of intuitive negative evaluation of swearing is perhaps what guides a lot of regulations about it that you know it's, it's just it's just something that has to be controlled and mm. punished and contained mm. and we're not necessarily thinking about why or under what circumstances or what makes the difference between a really objectionable instance of swearing and something that's more benign mm. now dr roach i want to follow up with a question that Again, you mentioned swearing can be very prevalent and it's understandable that it's part of the human emotion. I mean, it's a mechanism for us to unleash our anger and frustrations and disappointments, any sorts of emotion whatsoever. But again, from your research, why do you think that we behave differently when we are alone versus we're actually beating a meeting with people. For example, let's say we work in school. I mean, you're a professor and also I'm employed in a company. When we are frustrated, we can swear in a private space, but in front of leaders and in front of, uh, we we'll say, uh, superiors, we're more likely to withhold our emotions and we, or even sometimes we intentionally to use substitute to unleash our anger or emotional vulnerabilities. Why do you think we behave differently? Is that because we we would like to be good or would like to be considered as the good citizen versus the devil always appear on our shoulders? What, what do you say to that? Yeah, I think part of the answer here is that um, you know, if you zoom out from swearing specifically, it's just generally true that we behave differently mm. in different contexts mm. and, and differently when we're on our own compared to, you know, a, a much more formal setting. Mm. Um, so I think part of this is there's just sort of norms that apply to those sorts of settings. So if you are in a if you're in a job interview, then you will sort of dress smartly mm. and you know you'll be on your best behavior um because there's norms that apply to that situation that's how that's how it's understood right you're not sort of super familiar with the people you meet you're you're on your you know you, you behave politely mm. you present yourself in the best light and so on whereas you know those those norms just don't apply if you're you know if you're kind of working at home and you're not having any meetings then you can you, you can spend a whole day in your pajamas and, mm. and still not be acting mm. unprofessionally so yeah, part of it is about you know sort of what norms apply in those situations, and and swearing is part of that. You know, sort of swearing in in a job interview or a business meeting or you know some other formal context. There's going to be norms that apply. Um, obviously, not if you're on your own, but th there's also cases where you could be in other people's company and it is okay to swear so you know if you're a group of people that you know well and you just swear as part of your uh you know just part of the way you communicate with each other then that can be okay too that's that's not offensive so there is this sort of adherence to social norms but i think also often it's it's not only we don't only want to adhere to the norms but we want to sort of show that we know what the norms are and mm. we know how to respect them and so on so you know the job interview situation again you're, you're not only um behaving well because you're in this formal setting but you want the people assuming you want to get the job you want the people to see that you recognize what norms are in play and you're capable of 
um, behaving in accordance with them, right? So that mm. you can show that you're professional and so on. Mm. So it's this kind of clever dance that we do. <laughs> Um, you know, this sort of unspoken communication, I think. So in between what we actually say and do, there is this sort of message of, look, I know how to behave myself in polite company. And then part of that is not swearing. Mm. Dr. Roach, again, you dedicated a specific chapter, again, related to something quite stunning, that offensive swearing lead to bias and injustice. And again, I think too often we tend to think about the word bias. And, and again, I, I work for the media. So we look at those biased opinions and biased reports. And of course, that's become more popular these days. But we never, again, it never came to me that offensive swearing can lead to bias and justice. And I think we have to take a step back. Is In your book and from your uh, research, what will be the definition of, for offensive swearing and how does that lead to or how does that build this correlation between offensive swearing and bias and injustice what are the logistics behind that mm. yeah I, I mean we can so we can understand what offensiveness is in a few ways which um which i talk about in the book but um just to kind of gloss over that here you can think of offensive swearing as the sort of the sort of swearing that if you do it is going to cause people around you to uh to take it to take what you're what you're saying as a sign of disrespect to them mm. basically i mean there's the sort of glossing over a few things here um but i think the um i mean if you do that you know if you offend in a situation where people are likely to um take take your behavior as a sign of disrespect then it's not like they make an inference right they're not mm. sort of going oh you just said this word what mm. does that what does that tell me about your attitude it's all quite immediate right you sort of say the word and then they have this oh my god what did you say <laughs> you know there, there's this immediate shock so the the reaction that people have to swearing is is really sort of knee jerk mm it's immediate it happens you know we don't have to process it or reflect on it we, we just react with shock um at least in some cases um and i think that is where bias can creep in you know if we have these situations where we just react unthinkingly to mm. what somebody says and judge them negatively for it then that judgment can conceal all sorts of thoughts that we might have about the speaker that really ought not to figure in here mm. um and you know i talk in the book about there being this background of research on uh implicit bias mm. so uh attitudes towards somebody on the basis of their gender mm. their ethnicity their sexual orientation and all the rest of it and there's a sort of a wealth of research in psychology is sort of quite worrying alarming research showing that you know people people who are from various sorts of minorities are sort of judged more harshly or suffer worse outcomes um when people are sort of making judgments about them um they ought to be based on factors mm. that shouldn't figure at all so you know for example um a, a piece of research looking at um how likely job out applicants were to get a call back about a job based on identical CVs but um the difference being that some had names that were more kind of um you know if it was sort of English speaking culture sort of quite mm. English sounding names mm. versus names that sound like they might belong to somebody of an ethnic minority um or male names versus female names and what they found out is that um the people so sort of white men basically were much more likely to get called back about the job but you know when, when you when you talk to the people who are making these decisions they're you know they're well intentioned they are trying to be fair they don't want to be um making judgments based on you know anything other than somebody's qualifications and experience but these assumptions creep in nevertheless and i think where this relates to swearing is if we're making these knee-jerk reactions to swearing, you know, sort of, oh, that's offensive, what somebody said, um, 
then as well as sort of judging what they've said, we might also be smuggling in um, thoughts about what uh, what group they belong to, whether mm. they're male or female, mm. whether they're gay or straight, um, all the rest of it. And that's really worrying because, because, you know, as we've discussed, people do get punished for swearing and censored and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, and what we don't want to happen is for people from certain groups to be paying a higher price for swearing inappropriately mm. than others so i think you know especially where regulations are at stake um we want if, if anyone's going to be punished for swearing we want it to be sort of equal opportunities mm. right so that if you say the wrong thing in the wrong context then the punishment you receive is kind of comparable to any anyone else receiving the same punishment in a similar situation we don't want people from some groups paying a higher price than others mm. So very long-winded answer. No, that's I okay. That's I mean, again, you, you explain it in a very explicit way. And of course, again, that kind of tie into our next question is, I guess today, when we are in relationship with one another, I mean, again, we're looking at family relationships and we're looking at friendships and looking at, you know, marriage, you know, and sorts of uh, um, a partnership. Again, it's understandable that, Emotions can be the factors that make us either more excited or vulnerable or disappointed. I mean, we're human beings after all. So again, Dr. Roach, the next question is, towards different partners and towards different relationship, how can't we swear in a more polite way? I mean, so in other words, I mean, again, I am just venting. You know, I am just expressing my disappointments and my frustration, my anger, I don't really mean to offend anyone, but I have to let it out. Because this is one way that for me, for, I guess not for me, but for others to understand, this is not the moment to have a lecture with me. Or this is not the moment that you want to have this reasonable argument or reasonable uh, uh, conversation with me. I just need to let it out. So again, Dr. Roach, from your perspective, going back to the book, how can we swear in a more polite way without offending others? I mean, again, purposefully mm. or um, without purpose? What do you say to that? Mm. Well, I think to begin, you know, you've, you've described a situation there when sometimes you might have a certain experience you know, you might hit your thumb with a hammer or something mm. like that, and you just swear to give vent to your pain. Um, and I think in that sort of situation, you know, research shows actually that um, uh, people are more understanding of that. So if you're in a polite context and you swear in response to suffering s some sort of pain like that, then you might shock people, but there'll be some understanding there, some recognition of, mm. okay, that's that's fair enough, you've just hurt yourself. Um, so, so actually, you know, swearing to sort of vent that sort of emotion is perhaps more acceptable or more mm. excusable than just sort of dropping it into mm. conversation in a in a polite context. So, so there's a little bit of nuance there. Um, but I think also it's, so swearing can be used to, you know, as well as something that offends, it can be used in sort of more intimate contexts to establish trust mm. and build intimacy. Mm. Um, a famous study here is something that's sometimes referred to as the New Zealand Soap Factory Study, mm. which was from, I think, 2004. Um, and some psychologists in New Zealand went into a soap factory and recorded the conversations between the workers, you know, obviously with their consent, um, and just looked at the, the patterns of swearing between the workers and what they found is that between groups of workers who were friends with each other mm. um there was a lot more swearing than between people who were just colleagues mm. you know they just work together they don't sort of hang out together mm. outside of work um which is striking right because it shows that i mean it's striking and unsurprising <laughs> because it, it sort of shows that you know once you know somebody really well and you trust them then you can get away with swearing mm. um and i think this this is something that's often overlooked i think um you know if you are 
probably most of us have had this experience of, you know, you meet somebody new, perhaps someone in a professional context. And so you start out having this sort of fairly professional relationship with them. And then you you get to know them a little bit better. You maybe socialize a bit. And then at some point, somebody will relax enough to use a swear word. And it's quite risky at first, mm. right? Because your contact has been formal. You don't know whether they'll take offense. But if the other person sort of uh, just takes what you've said with 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 good intentions, right? They realize that you're not trying to upset them and that you're just relaxing a little bit. And also that you are trusting them to use that sort of language in their company. Then that can often help the relationship move to the next level, right? You can mm. sort of just, everyone relaxes, mm. everyone can sort of trust each other a little bit more. And then swell might become something that you can drop into conversation with them in a completely benign way mm. so you know not to do with anger not to do with causing offense but just sort of this is an informal context we're relaxing it's okay to use this language mm. so yeah it does have this um this role in social bonding too i think it's not always offensive mm. Dr. Roach, I got two more questions before letting you go. Now, let's talk about the role of social media. I mean, again, today, we're living in this technological advanced world, and we've seen that not only people are sharing their opinions and also their, um, I would say, um, disagreements in person, but also more often today, we tend to take it on social media. Now, the next question to you is, does the same regulation or rules apply in person and also has the same effect on using uh, uh, those profanity or swearing on social media? Because again, today we've seen, uh, owing to social changes and political disagreements, cultural uh, isolation, I mean, the reason can go on and on. But why do you think today, again, uh, just based on my observation around me as a journalist, that people are more casual, or should we say, more acceptable to swear via social media rather mm. than doing that in person. So do you think that social media has a role for us to be more open, to be more bold, and even to be more brave enough to swear instead of doing that in person? What, what do you say mm. to that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I think before social media really it was it was a much less common experience to see swear words mm. written in in typeface so you know because sort of newspapers would censor the language usually and so on but now you know with more of our lives conducted online and much of our socializing done on social media it's much more common to see swear words um so i think in one way we can view social media or, or the the communities that we establish on social media as just another social context mm. right so just as the different rules around swearing might apply when you are with your colleagues in an office versus with your you know old friends at a restaurant at the weekend you know sort of different sets of rules might apply to what sort of language you can use in each case um, we might see social media as just another extension of that. Mm. So, you know, sort of the way we communicate on Facebook, so there'll just be a, a different set of rules. But I think there are there are a few other factors to take into account here. Um, so one is that um, I think especially for people who are quite introverted mm. or have anxieties around communicating face to face. Uh, so, you know, people who, if you were, if they were going out with a group of friends, they might be more likely to be the ones who sit quietly and don't contribute very much. Um, things like social media give them perhaps an opportunity to express themselves without mm. anxiety. So it might be more uh, easy for them to express themselves um, through, you know, typing than, than face to face. And there has been a little bit of investigation done by psychologists around this. So, so there's something there's something called the the online disinhibition effect, mm. which r relates to the fact that um, people will be more open mm. and um, 
uh, and and sometimes negatively so. so so sometimes more aggressive mm. or sometimes sort of just more sharing emotionally in situations where they are where they can be anonymous now that doesn't that's, that doesn't always apply to social media i think because you you know most of the time we do use our our real names but some of the um some of the factors that have been discussed as behind that social disinhibition effect, you know, that, that contribute to our being more comfortable to open up and let our guard down are, are things like the, um, the, the the fact that our communication is not necessarily happening in real time. Mm. So if you write a comment on social media and somebody replies and then you reply back, this is not happening at the speed that it would do in if we were having a face to face Con conversation mm. right so it's it's sort of drawn out in time you know the time that you leave your comment is not necessarily going to be the time that they read it and so mm. on and also you you know you don't have things like eye contact mm. and, and this sort of thing so i think you know this all this can i think contribute to us just being willing to say things that we wouldn't necessarily say face to face mm. But I think on top of that, you know, if you look more generally as well in, in society generally, um, in a lot of cultures, we just are getting more informal. Right. Um, so, you know, sort of a lot of workplaces now will sort of deliberately choose a less hierarchical structure than mm. they have in the past, you know, where people can call their bosses by their first names um maybe don't have to dress as formally as they would have in the past um and perhaps you know things are getting more relaxed in other contexts as well and so if you just take a step back and think hey we're getting more informal um i think we we should expect swearing to be a part of that mm. because the, the the prohibition against swearing tends to be strongest in you know, sort of formal, really polite situations. Mm. And as we relax and as the rules around us relax, then you can expect people to be a little bit more open and free with their swearing. Well, Dr. Roach, I want to wrap up our conversation by asking you the last question. Again, going back to the title of the book, it's Why Swearing It's Shocking, Rude and Fun. Now, let's say for anyone that who has not read your book and it's still on this defensive side on swearing, what would you expect the readers to understand when they finish reading your book? And particularly, mm. how, how do you think that they can understand that swearing is fun? Your final thoughts. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, what you're actually what you're mentioning there is the subtitle. So the the, the main title of the book is kind of more difficult to say, <laughs> right? Guess, if you, because it has a swear <laughs> word in it, um, which is censored on the cover. Um, yeah, I mean, what I would what I would hope them to go away understanding is, I think the puzzles that I myself brought to this topic and that motivated me to start studying it. So things like, um, what is the we all are familiar with this really widespread belief that we ought not to swear, mm. that it's wrong to swear. Mm. Um, but, you know, what sort of wrong is involved here? Mm. I mean, it's not a moral wrong. <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's usually not a legal wrong, that, that sort of thing. So, you know, what, what, what sort of norms are we talking about here? So um, I, I'd like readers to go away with a sense of, you know, sort of, this is where the rules about swearing fit in with other things um, that we, that we think of ourselves as obliged or obliged not to do um and also a sense of sort of where it gets its power mm. um i've done a few interviews over the time of writing the book where, where people have asked this you know people have said things like you know when someone swears it we often have this sort of visceral reaction we kind of it, it's like it, it's kind of almost like a physical sting right, right. Like sometimes um, and so getting a sense of where it gets that power from, because it can seem really mysterious, I think. It's, you know, there's this sort of thought, on the one hand, don't say these words in this context, but on the other hand, well, they're just words. Right. Um, so I think that the, the, the magic of the offensive power seems to come from somewhere. Mm. And um, and where does it come from? So so that's, that's something I wanted to explore and hopefully um, help readers understand. And then I suppose also a um, some of the sort of 
seemingly contradictory things we do around swearing. So this is something that appears on the cover of the book as well. Um, you know, the fact that we can reduce the offensiveness of swear words by substituting some of the letters with asterisks, which is a really common thing to right. see, right, in um, print. Um, or, you know, if we're hearing it, uh, sometimes in broadcast, you'll hear a beep right. over the rude right. word. Um, and that's a way of censoring the swear words, but it usually doesn't obscure what the word is, mm -hmm. right? We'll sort of see this sanitized version or sort of hear a swear word bleeped out. And we'll usually, everybody will know what word it is, but yet it still seems to be successful in making swear words less offensive. And I think that's a really interesting thing to pick apart. So that is, um, that's that's something I wanted to in explore as well. And I think that tells us a lot about, you know, what it is that, um, that gives swearing its power. Mm. Well, Dr. Roach, one thing I have to say that it's an interesting read. And of course, it's a very enlightening and also it's very interactive for us to reconsider the definition of swearing and again um, it's something that worth discovering and really I encourage our readers to dive into your book again ladies and gentlemen it's my great honor to speak to Dr. Rebecca Roach again Dr. Roach it's a senior lecturer in philosophy at Royal Holloway in the University of London, and she teaches practical ethics, logic, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of psychiatry, and philosophy of language. And most importantly, I strongly encourage everyone to go online and look for her new book. It's called Why Swearing It's Shocking, Rude, and Fun. Well, Dr. Roach, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure, and we'll love to have you back on the show as we continue to discover the beauty of language and also some of the interesting topics within the linguistic field. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. It's been great to be here.